Good evening and welcome to the Iowa DNR Wing Shooting Education Workshop. We're excited that you are all able to join us tonight and brush up on some tips to get back out there in the hunting season. Our fall hunting seasons are definitely well underway, so this is a perfect timing to, to go over some, some tactics on wing shooting and, and ways you can improve um, while you go out there the remainder of the season. I believe that you all will enjoy this workshop tonight. Um, we have two highly trained uh, conservation officers joining us tonight to present the information. Um, both have went through extensive training in wing shooting and, and on the concept, which you'll learn a bit about here later on tonight and are, are super excited to, to share the information with you all. Before we get started, just wanna go over a few housekeeping items. Um, located at the bottom of your screen, you will see a menu bar and that'll have a couple features that we'll be using tonight. One will be the Q&A. So if you have a question during the presentation, please put those in the Q&A and we will either answer them live as we go along or um, one of the conservation officers will be writing responses throughout the to answer questions as well. So, so definitely don't hold back. Send in your questions as they, they come up so you don't forget about them and we'll get them answered at the appropriate time. The other feature that we have um, to use tonight is the chat feature. Um, this feature will allow you to chat with the panelists that are on. So if you have other questions or comments that you want to drop in on that feature, please do so and we'll continue to answer those as we go along tonight as well. Um, we're going to have multiple sessions tonight and um, in between each session we're going to take a short break and during that break we do have some polls or some questions that we were going to be asking all of you. Uh, we definitely want to encourage all of you just to take a few minutes to, to answer those questions and as we'll be sharing the results um, real time um, with everyone and that'll also help inform our instructors as we go through the rest of the presentations tonight. Um, lastly, before I turn it over to our, our two instructors tonight, uh, just want to to let you know that um, we've been doing several of these learn to hunt and, and education webinars this past fall and we plan to continue them on into the winter months as well. Um, a couple additional uh, workshops and webinars that we'll be looking at hosting later this winter will be on outdoor photography and then also we're doing some on outdoor cooking again with the, the topics being predominantly on breakfast items and then here in late February early March we'll be doing a three-part series on turkey hunting so definitely be on the outlook for those and we'll be getting more information posted to our website and and out on press releases and social media as those um, come into play so that you can get registered and signed up for those. But without further ado, I'd like to, to welcome our, our two officers tonight, um, Officer Steve Griebel, and then also Recreational Safety Officer Marty Eby to, to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about the program tonight, and then we'll jump in with the, the meat and potatoes of the topic. Hi guys, I'm Conservation Officer Griebel. Um, you've seen me uh, on some of these other uh, webinars, and uh, if you're up here in Woodbury County, uh, you've, you've probably seen me out and about as well. So I appreciate you guys coming. I think this is going to be a unique opportunity. It's uh, some really valuable information, particularly to the to the uh, the waterfall hunters and upland bird hunters that uh, that want to shoot the non toxic shot. And uh, I think if you have an open mind, you're going to definitely pick up a few things that'll make you a more successful hunter. And uh, just have to bear with us. This is the first time we've done this virtually, but uh, we'll uh, we'll let Marty introduce himself, and uh, we'll get back into the uh, into the training. All right, thanks, Steve. Uh, Steve said, my name is Marty Eby. I'm a recreational safety officer uh, from the Northwest Corner. And uh, several years ago, uh, I heard a little bit about this program and uh, convinced our management to uh, let a couple of us go uh, get trained in it. Uh, then we brought the trainer back to Iowa to train a bunch more of us so we could actually go around the state and do this. Um, the one thing I want to say is that uh, this information that you're going to hear tonight uh, is all statistically driven. And uh, the guy that uh, created the, um, the uh, uh, stuff to do the study uh, is one of the most, uh, what do you want to say, intelligent guys that I've been around, especially when it comes to ballistics and shooting. And uh, he can back up everything he says with the shotgun. So, uh, this training was way more intense than any college training I ever had. And uh, his philosophy was, if you don't know the material, you're not gonna teach it. So uh, we 
we, we dug into it and I think you'll find it uh, very interesting. I know it opened my eyes uh, because everything that I heard about the non-toxics and, and in particularly steel shots uh, was all put to, to rest and debunked. So uh, I think you'll find the information uh, very useful. And uh, then hopefully one day when we get through this other stuff going on, we can start doing our field days and, and you can come and put this knowledge to use and uh, we can try and help you improve your skills and uh, your shooting. So with that, go ahead and take it away, Steve. That sounds good, thanks, Marty. Well, I'm gonna share my screen, bear with me for just a second and we'll get into the information. All right, well, like I said, this is uh, our virtual version of this program. Uh, we're, we're gonna throw a lot of information at you, but we're gonna take plenty of breaks so you can kind of absorb some of that stuff as we go along. Uh, I have an open mind. Uh, a lot of things that you're gonna hear are gonna be different than what you've been told in the past. Uh, Marty mentioned that this came to him and uh, there were a lot of theories that were debunked. I can tell you, Marty's the one that approached me about it. And, um, you know, we always, we kind of go back and forth a little bit and, uh, you know, I got to say Marty was right. Um, I hate to admit that uh, in front of everyone, but he was. And uh, uh, there's some very, very valuable information. And uh, I can tell you it's changed the way I, shot, I, sh I shoot now. And uh, I can tell you uh, it's improved my shooting ability, saved me some money and made me a lot, lot more effective hunter. So, um, We'll get into this, and uh, as we go through it, just uh, make sure you ask questions if you have them, and remember, just have an open mind, and uh, by the end of this, I think you'll have uh, definitely have some different things you want to try when you get into the field. So why are we here? Um, most of you are hunters. You're interested in what we're doing and how to make yourself better. Um, I've always felt that knowledge is useless if it's not shared. Uh, I've had a lot of high-level training in, in this and some, in some wildland fire classes all the way through college, some, some really good stuff. But if I can't pass that on and put it to use, it's really, it's, it's in, it, there's no value to it. So uh, this virtual format is, is just to try and get this information out to you folks so that you can kind of digest it, start to put it to use uh, in the field and uh, hopefully make yourselves better. Uh, we still have a lot of the waterfall season left this year. There's a lot of pheasant season left. We're gonna go into the spring to the snow goose season. And, and if you wanna use non-toxic for turkeys, this will help you there as well. Help you help you pick out the shot and choke and, and gun combination that works best for you. Uh, now, typically this is a, you know, over an eight hour class with uh, classroom instruction and some practical shooting exercises. We're gonna try and shrink it down just to get that information out there. We think it's that valuable that we developed this program just to present it to you and, uh, and let you process some of it and, and put it to use. Um, to pass on the knowledge that uh, is um, to, to be utilized in the field, improve your shooting success and optimize your equipment. You probably already have what you need to be a successful hunter. Um, you don't need to go out and buy something special. You don't need to buy a special choke, special gun, special shot. You probably already have it. There's just probably some things that we can show you that will help you be a little bit better. Um, I need to mention this. This is not an anti-lead campaign. Um, as long as it's legal, we don't care what you shoot. Um, but there's some situations that, uh, that warrant non-toxic shot, obviously waterfowl, but in a lot of the areas, uh, especially Northwest Iowa, North Central Iowa, uh, steel shots required or non-toxic shot is required to hunt any on any of the game management areas. Uh, years ago, we were forced into, uh, I don't wanna say forced, but it became law that steel shot had to be used or non-toxic shot had to be used. And um, unfortunately, there was a lot of misinformation and people made poor decisions on guns and chokes and loads. So it wasn't overly successful and people felt like they were forced into it. Well, if we can educate you to make good decisions, show you that the non-toxic shot is effective, it's gonna be a lot easier for you to use. We're also not trying to sell you anything. We're not gonna endorse products. We may inadvertently say a name, but we're not saying one thing's better than the other. Um, as long as it's legal, that's great. Use what you want and um, don't get caught up in the hype. Um, everything that we're gonna tell you is not marketing or or market driven, it's, it's uh, like Marty said, statistically based and uh, it's scientific data. We wanna improve your shooting proficiency. Everybody can get better. Um, I, I, I've never hunted with anybody that doesn't miss. Um, we want you to be better stewards of the land. That's, that's responsibility too. And these kind of things all kind of work together on this slide. We wanna raise your awareness of your products and your hunting equipment. Like we said, uh, you, are, you probably already have most of what you need. Uh, there might just be some things that can help you be better. And we're gonna save you some money. Um, so all those things together, I, I don't know why anybody would not want to have those. Um, you know, you want to be a better shot. You want to be better at using what you have. You want to help save the resource and, and, and uh, like I said, save some money. That's all, all good stuff. 
Uh, we're going to discuss the future of wing shooting, where things are going. I've kind of already alluded to that uh, with uh, certain areas being purchased. Uh, there may be more non-toxic requirements on those, and let's, uh, let's learn about it so we can be effective when we go to those. Uh, we're going to discuss, discuss the myths about steel shot, shot strings, and modern products. There's a lot of myths out there. A lot of it is, uh, uh, it's, it's a lot of it's just made, but made up. It's make believe and it's, it's untrue. And we're also going to discuss properly choosing your gun, choke, and load combinations. Uh, I can tell you that uh, growing up, I just did what, uh, what seemed to be most successful. And in many cases, um, <clears throat> I could have uh, probably done a little bit better job and been a more proficient hunter had I um, uh, picked things a little bit differently. So I, I keep saying steel shot, we're gonna focus on steel. Uh, we have the most data on that. It's the most cost effective, it's readily available and it's, it's most commonly used. That's, that's kind of the go-to when people start talking about non-toxic shot. But there all, are also other legal and effective options. This myth, the tungsten alloys, there's a bunch of different brands out there. They're, they're all very effective. Some are more expensive than others, but generally as we go through this, we're gonna focus on steel because that's, it, it'll work. Um, up to 50 yards, it'll do everything that you need a shotgun to do, and uh, it'll do it better than a lot of other things and, and, and save you some money doing that. So um, that's what we're focusing on. We're not saying that there's not other stuff out there. As long as it's legal, that's the main thing. And, uh, but that's what we will be focusing on as we go through this. So Marty alluded to it briefly, but we want you to know that this, credible, this information is credible. This data was derived through independent research using scientific studies. The unbiased testing has resulted in data-driven facts which can be supported with repeatable results. That's how science works. You come up with an idea, you test it, you show that it works, and you move forward. Most of this information, we call it the wing shooting clinic. Most of it's based on uh, the, the concept program or the cooperative North American shotgun education program. <clears throat> that was a cooperative effort of state, federal, and foreign agencies. Uh, the concept board has recently disbanded, but it did when it was, when it was functioning, re include representatives from each flyway, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service and International Hunter Education Association. So some big groups, uh, very uh, a wide variety of knowledge, um, wide variety of trains and employees, very, very broad knowledge base there. So that's important to know. And Iowa was uh, one of the, the, the original states to get involved in this. Uh, we definitely have bought into this system. And uh, <clears throat> I can tell you in the field, talking to a lot of hunters and uh, you guys around Woodbury County, if some of you have already heard this spiel, probably when I, you know, when we when we ask about this out in the field, um, it's generally well received, and and the hunters that uh, uh, that buy in, just like we did as an agency, are are generally pretty happy. Now, all this uh, uh, all this research was done by Tom Roster, and he's an independent ballistics consultant. The key word there is independent. He 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 did have an employer at the time, but uh, he was doing scientific research on his own with his own scientific studies and uh, produce some reliable results that we're using today. What that program did was address several real and perceived issues regarding the use of non-toxic shot. Uh, there are some issues with steel shot or non-toxic shot. <clears throat> steel is lighter, it, you know, it travels differently through the air, all those different things. Some of, the, some of the things are not true. We can deal with some of the real run, the, the real issues, the perceived issues, that's just what you heard from your buddies. Those are opinions. Some of them don't matter. Uh, some of them are accurate, but uh, We'll get to all of them as we move through. So a little bit about Roster. Marty said he's very intelligent, and he is. Um, uh, he's an incredible shot. He's, he, he's incredibly intelligent and knowledgeable. Uh, but he worked for the Oregon Institute of Technology, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He got pretty high up in, in that, that uh, agency. He was the technical editor at Skeet and Shooting Review and the ballistics editor at Sporting Clays Magazine. So his, uh, his pedigree or his, his resume is pretty impressive. And uh, he can back up everything that he says, which uh, uh, will drive you crazy in a week long course with him. <clears throat> so back in 2012, uh, this was the group that went, um, went to the course. Uh, Marty, uh, Marty was able to, I don't know, it wasn't all Marty by himself, but Marty's the one that convinced me to go. And uh, I'm glad he did. It's, he said, uh, it's, it's really changed the way I've done things over the last eight years. Um, it was a week long course. We fired about a thousand rounds. And I can tell you that, uh, by the end of the course, shooting that many rounds, your, your shooting performance uh, is much better. But uh, like I said, I, you know, through the, the wildfire training, through the law enforcement training, uh, you know, I have a bachelor's of science, all the, all the high level college courses I took in biology and chemistry and genetics and physiology, all those things. Uh, this was one of the most challenging tests I've ever taken. The reason I say that is I want you to understand that 
he told us ahead going into this program, if you don't pass the shooting performance and you don't answer the questions to his satisfaction, he's not going to pass us. And he wasn't going to pass us in the class. And he didn't, there were several people that didn't make it through the course. And, um, that had a little bit of pressure to, at the start too. You know, you, you, your, your boss is sending you to work for a week and then you fail. But uh, fortunately we had a good group of instructors here with uh, the Iowa DNR that uh, made it through. And just want you to understand this. Uh, this isn't my opinion. Um, it's all, uh, it's all legitimate stuff. Um, and, and we did it and it was proven to us. And uh, um, even when we wanted to argue, we, we couldn't because uh, he was able to prove everything to us and, and back it up. You want to know where the numbers came from? Here's, here's some of the stuff that uh, Concept talked about. It tested the effectiveness of non-toxic shot loads by harvesting over 16,000 birds. That's a lot of, a lot of waterfall hunting. Um, that, that's more than what most people are going to ever shoot or a, more, a group of people are going to shoot in a lifetime. 225 turkeys. Even if you shoot two turkeys in the fall and two turkeys in the spring, you're looking at a lifetime worth of turkey hunting and 600 pheasants. That's a lot of birds as well. Uh, we did, or we, not we, concept had multiple tests regarding hunter behavior. That's very key because that's something that we need to realize and shooting skills. It's, it's not always the shot. It's not always a shotgun. It's, it's how we behave and, and, and our abilities as well. Again, you're going to see this come up throughout this course. There's no opinions. It's only science-based facts. The other thing is it ignores mar marketing strategies. He doesn't care. He went out and, and, and showed, you know, developed the science and, and showed what, what what steel shot mainly could do and it didn't matter if uh if one company advertised more than the other or one made more money for the vendors or the other um <clears throat> the marketing and the opinions were out the door it was only science-based facts so i've been talking fast i just want you to know this isn't a sales pitch we're going to take a short break and then we're really going to start learning so if you can just answer some of these questions we'll see where we're at as a group and then we'll get back after it in just a few minutes so one of the things we're going to talk about is wounding loss and that's a hunter's inability to retrieve game. It's pretty straightforward, right? The key to that is remembering that it doesn't matter if the hunter knows the game is wounded or not. If we, uh, if we wound a bird and it's gonna go off and die, a dead bird's a dead bird. There's no more chance for anybody to harvest that. It's not gonna, it's not gonna breed. It's not going to help pass on genetics. It's, it's, it, there's no benefit to that dead bird. It's, it's gone and out of the system. So uh, that's just key to remember. It doesn't matter if the hunter knows it's wounded or not. Uh, the, the big causes of wounding loss, they seem pretty obvious, but it's poor shooting skills, an inability to estimate distances properly. Those things we can both work on. Using improper load and choke combination, we're going to teach you how to fix that. Fail to properly pattern your gun, and you notice that properly is uh, highlighted there. We're going to teach you how to do that. And then shooting beyond one's own shooting ability. It doesn't matter what you're shooting. If you have a shotgun that can shoot 40, 50, 60 yards, if your abilities are not there, um, there, there's no point in shooting that far. So um, on the poll, that was one of the questions. You notice that nobody said they could shoot above 27 yards. Uh, keep that in mind a little bit later on here. We're going to, uh, uh, we'll have some, uh, some more statistics on that. And then uh, it seemed to be 15 to 25% was kind of the, uh, the biggest group of um, uh, birds that were lost. We're going to address that here in a little bit. But um, you see this little point here at the bottom is that historically hunters take six shots per duck and nine shots per goose retrieved. I think we can do better than that. That's a lot of shooting. You're talking 36 shots on average to bring home unlimited ducks. And again, this is over 200,000 rounds and 16,000 waterfowl harvested. So that's a lot of numbers to look at. What's the magnitude to that? Back in the 1930s, we're talking nearly, you know, nearly a decade or nearly a century ago, about 18%. That's what hunters reported that, you know, they were around 18% loss. Jump up into 98, just a few decades ago, we're still right around that 18% mark, 17.9. Okay? And then you guys were right there today in that 15 to 25. So the point being is that hunters don't always see all the wounded game and the rate has remained the same regardless of the shot type used. Obviously a hundred years ago, we were using lead shot after in 98 and you know, since the late eighties, we've been using the non-toxic stuff, mainly steel. And the wounded rates remain the same from what the hunters have seen. So what's the real magnitude? And this is kind of interesting. And this is where the numbers start to get uh, a little bit fuzzy for us. In roster study, it indicated that the wounding rate was over 30%. That's really significant. That's, there's a couple of people mentioned that in the, in the poll that we showed, but most of you are well under that. 
30% is a lot of birds. That's, you know, nearly one out of three. You put that in bigger numbers, that means four to four and a half million waterfowl are not recovered each year. That's a lot of birds. Um, you're, you know, you're looking at a 14, 15 million bird harvest. When you're losing that many, that's significant. Those, those birds aren't coming back to reproduce next year. They're not flying down the flyaway and, and giving hunters an opportunity to, uh, to harvest them. And uh, this is one of the reasons that we need to, <clears throat> we need to improve. Add to that, we switched to steel shop because we lost about 2 million waterfowl annually due to lead poisoning. So we're, we're doubling that in wounding lost. That seems like a pretty significant number. Surveys indicate that the non-hunting public is going to accept a wound rate of about 10% per less, 10% or less before voting against hunting. Well, let's think about that. We're, we're three times what the hunting, the non-hunting public will accept. If we were able to switch a shot type that the entire continent needs to use because of 2 million, and we're losing four to four and a half million and not recovering them, it's, it's kind of the same thing. And, and if they're only expecting 10% and we're 20% we're over that, we need to improve. So that's why we're here. We're trying to learn how to do better. <clears throat> and there's some keys to obtaining that under 10% wounding loss. We can influence hunter behavior. That's, that's what we're doing. That's how we act. And we can improve their shooting skills. Both of these things can be dealt with. And how we do that? Through education. You guys are here today. You're probably getting sick of hearing us talk, but we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of this real soon. But we got to build up to that so you understand why we're here and what we're talking about. <clears throat> so again, we're going to take a quick break. We've got a few more questions to ask, and then we're going to keep going. But again, historically, the hunters are going to take six shots per duck and nine shots per goose retrieved. These aren't, weren't all clean misses. We're losing millions of birds each year because of our poor, poor, poor shooting performance. So let's do better. Let some of those things sink in, and we're going to be back here in just a couple minutes. All right, well, let's get back to it. Hey, Steve. Yes, sir. Can I jump in for a second? Uh, this is Marty. Um, once again, I'm not uh, real good at this uh, computer game, but uh, Nate had a question uh, about how are they or concept determining uh, lost or wounded game. Uh, the way that when Steve talked about that 16,000 plus waterfowl uh, to get this data and the 600 pheasants and the 225 turkeys, um, the way that data was all gathered was um, those birds were all harvested at known ranges with known chokes and known loads um, by um, hunters uh, who were um, uh, being observed by other hunters, okay, uh, trained people of Tom Rosters, okay. And then the other thing that they did was they had people that were uh, trained observers um, hunt or uh, observing blinds without the other hunters knowing about it. Um, and then they would watch birds that were wounded. And then they did question and answers with those individuals uh, to obtain uh, you know, what they saw for birds being harvested, what they thought the wounding and stuff was. So all those birds were shot with known loads, chokes, and distances um, by trained observers. And then they were all taken back to uh, Roster's lab uh, and necropsied. And they uh, took wound channel, depth, and analysis. And then uh, later on, you're going to see what all that information was put into, into a chart. So um, that's how they determined the wounding loss through trained observers um, uh, watching hunters uh, on controlled hunting areas uh, in various states. Thanks, Marty. Yeah, obviously that's a pretty important part of this, Nate. Uh, we, uh, when I was talking about the scientific studies, I should have done a better job of explaining what that was. So uh, yeah, the hunters, they, were, they didn't know what they were shooting. They were just going hunting and, and hunting the way they regularly were. And uh, the observations were all recorded. So uh, thank you for asking that question. So we're yeah, going to talk one more little... quick follow up one, Steve, to that. Another question that came in is how do they find the distance for a flying bird accurately, or is it just a guess? They actually use range finders. Um, you can, um, and I've done this because I, asked, I wondered that same thing. Um, you, you follow the bird in with the scanning range finder, and uh, they, uh, they would figure out where they were in that first shot and 
you know, there's always some variation in a, in a, in a study and that was put, worked into their equation. But uh, uh, I've done this, my, like I said, I've done this myself in the field and uh, particularly snow goose hunting uh, when everybody's, uh, all your buddies are kind of jawing at you to, to call the shot. And uh, you can say, well, those birds were over hundred yards. Well, it's a big white bird up against the sky and they're too far away to shoot, but uh, they definitely peer closer. So yeah, they actually use range finders. So we're gonna talk a little bit about ballistics, quite a bit about ballistics, and, and that will help you understand where we're going with this stuff today. So the first one to talk about is interior ballistics. It takes place while the pellets are in the firearm. That seems kind of obvious, right? That's why they call them interior. Exterior is while the pellets are out traveling through space outside the firearm, and terminal is when they hit the target. We also have to compare apples to apples. One of the questions that we asked was uh, what's heavier, steel number four or lead number four? Comparable size, lead is going to be heavier than steel. It's more dense. So that's 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 very important to remember in this. And uh, the rule, so to have the same weight or the, <clears throat> the same mass going through the air, the kind of the steel shot rule of thumb is to use two shot sizes larger than the, than the old days. So if you like to shoot number four lead or you like to shoot number five lead at, at pheasants or whatever it might be, go two shot sizes larger for steel. Um, and right now I know there's a couple people out there going, well, I need more pellets. And we're going to get to that because that is the key to your success. And again, you can remember an ounce is an ounce. It doesn't matter. We're not talking volume. We're talking weight. And so we'll show you some things here that will help you understand that. And uh, the number of pellets is the key to success. So inside the shotgun shell, you have lead shot, which is deformable. Uh, you get some bore scrub. And that is deformation caused as the pellets travel down the barrel. You get setback, and that's deformation caused when the pellets hit each other as they overcome inertia. Basically, when that when that powder is lit off, it goes from zero to fast instantly, and those pellets will uh, kind of hit each other and fill in the gaps. So they they all get just form, de deformed slightly. <clears throat> Extrusion, uh, that's also caused when it's kind of like when you throw pool balls in a in a bucket and then dump water. There's still room. Uh, same same principle. There's the big air spaces between the pellets and they, uh, they, they, they smash together under all of that pressure and it will cause, um, cause some deformation. Uh, the pellets that are at the bottom of the, of the shot column, uh, when that, uh, when that powder is lit off and the setback are gonna deform more than the ones at the top. That's also a point I should have made there. In the loading process, I know there's some hand loaders out there. I've talked to people in the field doing the same thing. Uh, you, you slide that charge bar across and it catches on a pellet. Well, that pellet is now deformed slightly. Steel shot's non-deformable. So right there is a, that's a that's a big key to this. It's hard and it doesn't deform as well as, as much. And so you don't have all those same problems. And how does that matter coming out? So that's all inside the inside the shot shell and coming out of the barrel. Once that starts to fly through the air, here's what happens. The lead pellets that have been more deformed uh, will slow down faster than the larger diameter pellets. They don't have as much mass. The more deformed pellets will slow down faster than the less deformed pellets. <clears throat> they're they're going to have more drag. They're less aerodynamic, so they're going to they're going to slow down much faster. They're going to fall behind the 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 the, the fastest, most aerodynamic pellets are going to fly out front. As they become more deformed, they're going to diverge more from the center and fall farther back. So in this last point, if you could if you could picture the shot string going through the air, the more deformed the pellet is the farther outside it's gonna be making your pattern larger and the farther back it's gonna fall making your shot string longer. What that amounts to is when you're shooting lead, one of the questions we asked is lead or steel pattern better. The shot string is, again, comparing apples to apples, the shot string is longer and larger in diameter than it is in steel shot if you're shooting lead. So steel shot, the pellets are gonna to cluster together they're going to be more uniform. They're out there. They're going to deform less inside the shotgun, inside the shell and the loading process, all those things when they come out, but there's always still going to be some variation. They're not all perfectly symmetrical. They're not all the same density, even though they're the same size, there's always some variation in the steel. So there's going to be some lengthening in the shot string and some divergence from center. <clears throat> but again, the shot string is going to be shorter and smaller in diameter than lead. So what does this look like? We talked about it. We say lead's longer and wider than steel on general, but uh, what does that look like on paper? And we've all seen something like this. I know there's probably a couple out there nodding. 
And uh, if you, you stand at the back of the picture here and, and, and shooting towards the bird and looks like there's a whole bunch of pellets up there in the front widened out and it's kind of uniform all the way through and to the back and just they're kind of scattered. It's got some, some measurements on there, bird going 40 mile an hour, four feet, 10 feet away. None of that means anything. I'm telling you that there is no shotgun choke in the world that's shooting a four foot pattern at 10 feet. This is incorrect. We've all seen it. There's nothing here that's correct. This is gonna be more realistic. If you see the bottom, this is something of rosters that he's allowed everybody to use. There's a lot of information on this slide and we're actually gonna to get to it uh, a, a little bit later. You'll see this again, but these pellets are going left to right. That you see the direction of flight arrow. The top is lead, the bottom is steel. The top is an ounce and a quarter load of number fours. It's about 169 pellets on average. The bottom is an ounce and a quarter load of number twos. Again, that two, uh, two shot size is larger. You're still around 156 pellets and we're going from left to right. You can see that that pattern is about 60 or 70% the diameter and it's about 50 or 60% the length of lead shot. Now they actually use cameras to see this and they've um, high speed cameras. And then obviously you can measure the diameter on paper but uh, the shot string is a little more challenging. And that's not something we can see with our eyes. But the, the key here is looking at the leading edge of this. On the right side of the screen, it, it's pointed. The, the shot column or the shot string is going through the air like a spear point. Your, your most similar pellets are gonna be up front leading the charge. That's where your pattern is gonna be most dense. And as the pellets become more deformed, <clears throat> they're gonna fall back and, and, and go out to the sides. So we've got about the same number of pellets here, but with steel shot, those pellets are in a much smaller area. So you're gonna have a more dense pattern. That, that's key to realizing what, what, uh, what uh, you need to do when you're looking at steel shot because of how much more effective it can be than lead. So the general rules of exterior ballistics are that the shot string is about half the length and two thirds of diameter of steel. Do the steel shot not become deformed, making the pellets fly truer and more aerodynamically than lead. Steel decelerates faster downrange because it's lighter. We already talked about that, but we can take care of that by going two shot sizes larger. <clears throat> a, a number four lead pellet, number two steel pellet, weigh very, very similar in, in mass and in densities. With steel shot, a shooter does have less margin for error. What, you got that shorter shot string, which is smaller in diameter. And so you do have to be a little bit better shot, but we can, we can deal with that by using the proper choke and load selection. Um, some may say that's a bad thing, but you're gonna have more cleaner and more, more clean misses and more consistent kills. I talked to hunters that hunted decades ago and they always talk about how they just seemed to always get to that bird with that magic pellet. Well, and they probably did get some of those with that magic pellet. But when you're consistently catching birds with the back edge of the pattern, you're crippling a lot more than you're actually bringing home. So we can go to the non-toxic shot. We can tighten up our chokes or tighten up our pattern, a little bit shorter shot string and, and hit birds with a more dense shot, shot string and, and make more clean kills. <coughs> so now we're gonna talk about terminal ballistics a little bit more. And this is key. Remember, you got to compare the pellets of the same energy. So we're going to go number two steel, number four lead. That's kind of like the, the, the all around load that everybody likes to shoot. And that's why we use it for most of our explanations. Lead being more deformable um, is going to have 10 to 15% less penetration. Again, Marty mentioned the, uh, uh, the studies that roster did. They took all those birds back and, and took x-rays of them and did the necropsies. And this is how they found this stuff out. The the, the lead had 10 to 15% less penetration than steel. And that's probably caused by feather balling. Feather balling is when those feathers stick to the pellets as they go through them, because uh, the deformed pellets are, are, are catching on the feathers. They grab them and then they try to, they try when they try to penetrate the meat into the vitals, uh, they're not making it because the feathers slow them down too much. And um, I've shot a lot of birds, particularly obviously pheasants with, with lead shot. And you always seen that. If, if you're out there hunting and you've, you've harvested a few birds with lead shot, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Steel shot <clears throat> penetrates a little bit farther. There's less deformations. The feathers don't stick to the pellets and the larger pellets will actually travel through, through the birds, feathers, through the meat and hit the vital organs. 
There's a couple other things to remember. Uh, when, uh, it doesn't matter the type of shots you're using, but uh, when birds are going away from you, the past 35 yards, you're not going to be able to penetrate through the gizzard. It's basically like a sandbag. You know, the military uses sandbags to protect our troops with rifles. It's, it's the same principle for these birds. All you're going to do is end up crippling them. So try not to shoot birds that are going directly away from you. Pellets don't perform like bullets. They're, they're more like little arrows. They're not, they're not delivering hydrostatic shock. They don't have the mass or the velocity to deliver uh, these devastating wound channels like a, like a rifle bullet would. So you need multiple strikes in, uh, in the vitals, either the vital organs or the, the central nervous system to put the birds on the ground quickly. And so <clears throat> when you have wounded birds, you have a small number of hits in the periphery area of the bird, but you didn't hit any vital organs. If you got dead birds, you had multiple pellet strikes hitting the core area of the bird and penetrating through to hit those organs. And again, this is, this is important to remember. So the, the knockdown power is not something that we have in, in shotgun shells. We're, we're punching holes through vital organs in the central nervous system. So there's, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, that's probably different than what you've learned in the past as far as uh, what the patterns look like, as far as the, the penetration on the pellets. Uh, Steel does slow down faster. Steel is lighter, but by going a couple shot sizes larger, you can make up for all those facts. You have the same number of pellets going through the air, gives you the same number of chances to hit the bird. Steel's gonna be a little bit tighter shot string. That's gonna help you uh, uh, put more pellets in a tighter circle to, to put more pellets in the vital areas of the bird. So I'm um, gonna let you process some of that. I'm sure we generated some questions. We'll catch up in the chat room and answer a few poll questions and then get back to this after a couple, a couple minutes. Steve, real quick before we go to our break, there was a question that came into us uh, through the chat that others may be interested in or maybe having the same um, thoughts or questions and just thought I would repeat that real quick. And it was, would the lead deformation be eliminated if I used copper plated lead? So right. there's, you know, different ammos out there that, that are plated. So I think right. folks might be interested a, in that. Yep, that's I a very good question, that, Steve. Right. Oh, yep, I can. I, I tried to answer that in the chat room. Um, the answer to that would be no, it wouldn't uh, eliminate that deformation of the lead because there's not enough of it there. So it's all it is is a copper plating. And it's not strong enough to um, not deform because the lead's soft underneath it. So... Um, the copper plating is not going to cause it to uh, stop the the be becoming deformed because uh, it's it's the the soft lead underneath it. That's correct. If you if you would cut open one of your copper plated shells, you'd see that a lot of that copper plating is actually worn off, and so it's 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 a marketing scheme. It is better than just lead because it's slightly harder, but it's too thin to matter. The other thing that they'll do is put buffering to try and and, and make up for the extrusion. So by the time you play for a copper plated buffered load, now you're, now you have a premium lead shot shell, which costs a lot of money. Um, you could just shoot steel shot, which already has the characteristics and your bottom end steel shot is out going to, is going to outperform the top end lead shot. So um, that's, that's just a fact of the matter of, of, of the materials that they're using um, to make up for some of the, uh, the pattern differences. Uh, we'll talk about patterning here in a little bit and uh, go from there. So we'll, uh, we'll answer some of these questions. I, I appreciate that. And that was a very good one. And um, I will uh, make sure I add that to the next time we do this. There's a, uh, it's a little bit more challenging doing this in a virtual manner than in a classroom, but uh, uh, we're trying to hit most of those points. So I appreciate you guys asking those questions and please keep asking them so we can get them addressed. Yeah. Steve, one other question. Uh... I'll answer live here while we got a minute. Um, one of the questions was, could you please explain uh, the comment about shooting at birds going straight away uh, in the 35 yards? Um, you got to remember that our goal when we're shooting birds or any animal for the most part is we want to hit the vitals and or the central nervous system. And if you look at the anatomy of a bird, which is what we're talking about here, um, if that bird's flying basically straight away from you, uh, everything is covered uh, on the backside by the gizzard. And like Steve said, it's like a little sandbag. And so uh, once that bird gets that 35 yard or farther, there's not enough energy uh, to penetrate through that gizzard and into the vitals or the central nervous system. So what you're gonna do is typically if that bird's going straight away, uh, you're gonna break a wing, uh, you could drop a leg, 
and then um, you've got a wounded bird. So that's that's where that uh, uh, 35 yards and the gizzard comes in. Um, it's like I said, just like a little sandbag back there and uh, there's not enough energy to go through it and get into the vitals. Thanks, Marty. So I think we'll, um, it looks like we had a few more questions coming in. We'll answer some of the polls and then we'll, uh, we'll continue to answer questions after they're done. Yep, I'll, I'll try and answer these two when we get back. So we're gonna talk a little bit about pellet count. Um, that is, uh, sorry, too many times there. This, come, this is the nuts and bolts. This is what's going through the air. This is what's gonna hit the bird. And this is what's gonna put the bird on the ground if you put enough pellets through the vital organs or the central nervous system. Uh, a few things to remember is that the gauge and length of shot shell are irrelevant. Uh, you're gonna see three inch loads in the 12 gauge that have an ounce and three eight shot. And you're gonna see three and a half inch loads that have less than that. Uh, there, there's all kinds of different games that the shot shell companies play with different powders and different speeds, all this stuff but it really comes down to how many pellets are going through the air. So always consider the shot charge. When you're talking shot charge, one ounce is one ounce. It doesn't, rem it doesn't matter what shooting that one ounce, it's the number of pellets, okay? So if you're gonna look at this chart, you can see that the, um, the lead is in tan and the steel's in green. So we've been talking about twos and fours and here they are. So an ounce and a quarter load, that's kind of a standard load in a three inch shell. That's, that's one of the more popular loads. If you go to uh, number four lead on the bottom, that's 169 pellets. You jump up to number two steel shot, you're at 156. That's a pretty similar number. You're, you're talking less than uh, you know, like seven, eight percent difference there. So um, <clears throat> there are there are a few less than number twos, but it's it's similar enough that uh, we'll, we'll take that because remember your pattern is shorter and your pattern is smaller in diameter. So if you went to any certain spot in that pattern, it's gonna be more dense with those number twos. So uh, that's a pretty big point. Uh, that was kind of a, a turning point for me when I started learning through this uh, information that uh, by changing my shot size, I ain't going to steel shot, I really didn't lose the number of, uh, you know, if I was doing air quotes, number of chances to hit the bird. So this is that pellet that we talked about or that, that <clears throat> pellet count diagram that we talked about before when we were talking about patterning and you see the two red arrows there you got 169 pellets and 156 but if you look at the distance that they're spread out i'm going to take that uh, that 156 pellets of steel every time they're they're denser and you're going to put more tar more pellets on the bird every time you pull the trigger so how do we fix that pattern it's a little bit tight maybe maybe we want to open it up so how do we know exactly what we're shooting? How do you know maybe uh, one brand and one one brand of gun, one brand of ammo, one type of shot, one speed? It's all different. We got a pattern test. <clears throat> you have to be now a little bit knowledgeable about ch loads and chokes. And in general, that's great, but you need to be knowledgeable about your loads and chokes, what you want to shoot, what you have, and what works best for you. You must pattern test guns to attain the, the minimum required density standards. Okay, so we're going to go back and we're going to make this scientific. You can look at that paper, you know, you can shoot a piece of paper and you got a bunch of holes in it. What does that actually mean? Nothing if you don't have anything to compare it to. So Rosser developed a lethality table and you can compare your pattern to this. And we're going to teach you how to do that. So you have some, some confidence in your, in your uh, gun and load and choke combination. The biggest thing I always hear when we start talking about patterning is that it takes too much time and shotgun shells are too expensive. Trust me on this, that investment in time and ammunition up front is gonna save you future money and a lot of frustration. If you shoot what works, you're gonna be much more successful. You're gonna have a happier hunt. You're gonna put more birds on the ground and you're not gonna be shooting six, six times at every duck and nine times at every goose on average. Remember that was over 200,000 rounds that were observed. So it's not like we don't, we don't watch one hunt that somebody shot bad that day. That's a couple hundred thousand rounds. And uh, that, that's a lot of data to use. So we're gonna talk a little bit about chokes. Now, relatively speaking, uh, cylinder chokes or skeet choke, let's get my typo there, sorry about that. The cylinder choke or the skeet choke is gonna be most open followed by improved cylinder, modified, improved, modified and full on up into your extra full turkey chokes, right? But what a lot of people don't know is that there's no standard in choke constriction between manufacturers. You take gun brand A and gun brand B and gun brand C, all in 12 gauges, all modified chokes, there's no standard in measurements. So we, we don't know what they are. Um, there's variation within the manufacturers. Uh, some, some manufacturers, 
even in their own brands have different chokes. <clears throat> they call this the premium choke or that, you know, this, that, or the other, this one's better. Well, maybe they just tightened up the constriction and called it modified. So you think it's better. So it's a marketing game. So it's really irrelevant, but it's a good place to start. Pattern your gun and your chokes. That's the only way to truly know. So here's how we're going to pattern test a shotgun. If you properly pattern your gun, load and choke, that allows you to use roster's lethality table. When using this table, if you fire 10 rounds, that's going to give you 95% reliability. That does take a lot of time and money. We don't generally do that in the class. We do three. That's not going to give you 95% reliability, but it's going to give you a lot of confidence to, um, to, to, to give you a good, uh, a good choice. If you really want to test it after you find something that works, then shoot, to, shoot 10 and uh, uh, that'll give you a little bit, a uh, little bit better reliability. This is going to provide you that confidence. Okay, if you know that your gun and load and choke combination can do what roster is saying you need to do, that's going to make you a lot more effective when you get out in the field. You know that the only job now is to hit the bird. Uh, personally, I don't think there's anything more frustrating than when you shoot and you think, man, I, I should have hit him. What happened? You know, is it did I not have enough pellets? Did I should have had a bigger shot size? All those things that we start second guessing ourselves. If you follow this method you can have the confidence that, uh, that the gun and, the, gun and the, the ammo can do it. So this is the lethality table. We're gonna talk more about this in a little bit. We'll go through an example, but uh, <clears throat> this is, um, there, there's a lot of different things. So we're gonna start up in the top left box and you see there where it says load velocity, 1225 to 1600 feet per second. As long as your loads are going that fast, over 1200 feet per second, um, Everything here works uh, out to you know out to past fifty yards. Um, the the hyper velocity stuff, really the way they're getting that is going with less shot. Um, and you'll notice that you jump up to these three and a half inch shells or the three inch shells with an ounce and a sixteenth of shot or an ounce and a quarter and a three and a half inch shell. You have less pellets. Uh, that's just beating you up on the recoil side of things. And we'll talk more about that later. But um, keep your loads in this velocity, and that's going to help you out. Then the next one is your. Your typical range or your, your activity, that's whether you're going to shoot long, large geese, you know, giant Canada's at long range or over decoys, all the way down to say the, the teal and, and, and buffalo heads over decoys. <coughs> the next column is the uh, typical shooting range. The first day activity, that, that's a standard. The next one is your average range, you know, for, if we're looking at uh, large ducks like a mallard, you know, say 45 to 65 yards. Next column is the the, the non-toxic shot sizes that are good starting points. This is kind of what they'd recommend you start with. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> a lot of times we're looking at number twos and, and ones for, for big ducks at long range. But if you look at large ducks over decoys, the next column down, it's, it's steel sixes all the way down, up to number two shot. The next column is the, is the shot charge. Again, just a, a rough guess of where to start. You're talking three quarters to one ounce. More is great but you definitely want to at least start out in that range. The next column, I'm not sure why the, the labels didn't show up here today, but uh, they need one to two hits. But you're looking for one to two hits in the central nervous system or the vitals of these birds. So you're going back to that, that load of number two steel with 156 pellets. You just need one or two of them to strike something. We should be able to get that done, okay? Now this next column, the minimum, minimum pattern count needed at, at whatever distance you decide is inside of a 30 inch circle. This is where the math gets in there for rosters. So if you're going to shoot large ducks over decoys, you need 85 to 90 pellets inside of that circle. Okay. But you got to remember something in pattern. It's only two dimensional. Okay. You can look at it. It looks great in that 30 inch circle and you're going to see holes in this and that and the other, but you got to remember it's going through space as a three dimensional object. Okay. So if you're talking turkeys, a stationary, a stationary target. Yes. Maybe, maybe then you, you can, you can use a different method, but Roster through all of the all the, the rounds fired, all the ducks that they killed, how many hits were in that bird, the necropsies, all those things. This they determine how many hits you need inside of a 30 inch circle to have the math the mathematical uh, chance of of putting that number of pellets in a bird. The next column is is just kind of a starting point. Again, improved cylinder, modified full. That's all relevant to to your gun, uh, and so it's just a starting point. And their recommendations. So this is something you can find online. We used to publish it in Iowa hunting regulations. We can get it to you if you need it. But uh, if you if you use this method, <clears throat> it will definitely help you. And we're gonna we're gonna work through this and show you how to do it. 
<clears throat> so the first thing you're going to do is decide what species and type of hunting you want to do that's listed on that table. It covers everything if you really get down to it. So in this example, let's just consider that we're going to shoot decoying mallards and have a desire to shoot a 20 gauge out to 40 yards. Does that seem attainable? Some people will wonder, some people say no, some people say yeah. Um, I can tell you I've watched it happen. If you ask Marty, uh, he'd probably chime in that the 20 gauge is his favorite gun anymore. So the red area, we're going to look at large ducks over decoys. This time of year, we're concentrating on mallards. You know, earlier in the year, maybe we want to look at teal, right, and doves. So uh, the new roster table is, is going to include dove information. We're still working on getting that implemented into our class. But for now, uh, we're talking late November. Most of the doves are gone, and we're looking for, uh, we're looking for the greenheads, as all the duck hunters this weekend told me. <clears throat> Next thing we need to do is figure out how far we want to go. Well, 20 to 45 yards, that seems like a pretty good thing. We, we guessed 40 yards, so we're right in there. Now we got to pick a shot size. We don't know exactly what we want to shoot. Six to twos, let's go right in the middle and, and say we're going to use number fours. So we want to use at least a three quarter to one ounce shot, shot, shot to charge. And we need to get 85 to 90 pellets in that 30 inch circle. Right here, we're going to go improve cylinder or modified choke. Let's try the improved cylinder because uh, that's what we happen to have. That was what's in the gun. It, it, it maybe you have a fixed choke gun. We're going to use number fours because of your ammunition on hand. Maybe that's what your buddy said. You talked to Marty and he said, yep, I like shooting one ounce of fours at ducks. So, hey, let's give it a whirl and see what happens. So the first thing you're going to do is post three four by four foot sheets of paper. Okay. And we want it to be four foot by four foot. We'll talk a little bit why here in a second. You want to shoot 40 yards, so we're going to add five yards from misjudging range. We're not very good at that. Uh, bow hunters are pretty good at it, but uh, once you get out to that 30, 35, 40, 50 yard range, it gets a little bit harder. The farther out it is, the worse we do it at judging distance. So you got to add five yards. So in this example, we're going to shoot from a 45 yard line at those three pieces of paper. You got to fire around at each paper. Okay. The next step is to draw a 30 inch circle around the most dense part of each pattern. You notice that it says most dense part. I didn't ask you to shoot at a picture of a duck. I didn't ask you to shoot at a cardboard cutout. I just wanted you to shoot at a four foot by four foot piece of paper. If you're shooting high and right or low and left or low and wherever and not in the center, that's, that's not a pattern issue. That's a point of aim issue. That may be the way you're holding your gun. Your gun may not be aligned properly. Maybe you just flinched, whatever that may be. That's something else that you have to deal with in your shooting performance. But we're talking about patterning. So you find the most dense part of the pattern. What we use is a piece of 30 inch plexiglass. That way we can see through it and make sure that we got the most dense area. You're gonna draw a circle all the way around that with a marker and you're gonna count the pellets inside or touching the lines. And then you average the three totals, okay? Or 10 if you wanna have 95% reliability. So after you complete them steps, you shot the paper, you drew the circle around the densest part, counted all the pellets inside the circle or touching it, you averaged 80 pellets. Now, according to the lethality table, you, you only had, you need to have 85 or 90. You're just a little bit short. Will it work? Yeah, sure. Sometimes, maybe every time, maybe, maybe 10 times in a row, but you also might miss 10 times in a row. To get back to Roster's reliability and his scientific work, we got to do something different. But what is that? You got a couple options. You can tighten your choke to modified, right? We already started with improved cylinder. Now, whatever you're shooting, whether it's uh, gun A or gun B, your modified is going to be tighter than your improved cylinder. Doesn't matter what your buddy shot, this is what you shot. <clears throat> you can move closer. Maybe you can only shoot to 35 yards. Maybe you can only shoot to 30. Whatever it is, we gotta figure it out. Remember talking about the, uh, uh, the average shooter being uh, uh, effective, it's, it's 23 yards, but you know we got people shooting at 50 to 60 yards. You can shoot a heavier shot charge. If you start out with three quarters of an ounce, go to one. We started with one. Maybe you got to go to an ounce and eighth or ounce and a quarter. You got to find something just a little bit heavier to get more pellets in there. Or you should just smaller shot size. We already at number fours. Maybe we jump up to number sixes. The key is test your new combination. Okay. So that didn't work out. You got to do something different. Otherwise, you're not going to have the success that you could potentially have. So let's say that you do that. <clears throat> you have great luck. Perfect. But let's say that you somehow manage to shoot 140 pellets on your next 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 shot next group of, of uh, patterning targets. Number four shot averages about 189 pellets an ounce. 
in steel. So you, you, you put 140, you know, that's about a 75% pattern for the guys that are wondering on the math there, but you're putting about 75% of them in that 30 inch circle. According to the lethality table, you need 85 to 90 to shoot large ducks over decoys. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna go shoot ducks. Here's why. Large ducks at long range, or large ducks at de over decoys, you're talking um, 20 to 45 yards. Your number fours are in there. You're putting 140 pellets in that circle. That's great, you're way over, okay? You could actually shoot further in theory. You can also shoot the gad walls and widgeon that come over, maybe a couple of bluebills buzz by. You're still up there in your pellet count to be able to effectively harvest them. And the guys that are running up here in Northwest Iowa this week, we seem to have an uh, inordinate number of green wing teal around. Uh, they're pretty small. And look, you're still in that pellet count, you're 135 to 145. So 140 works. So you can take that 20 gauge with your improved cylinder choke and one ounce load on, on that particular load and, and be confident that you can shoot any ducks that you want to shoot out to 40 yards. So that's what we're talking about is, is actually putting some math to this and, and, and testing your loads and chokes to know where you're at. So I'm sure that generates some questions. And that's a lot to, uh, to soak in quickly. Hopefully it makes sense. The key there is test what you have. It doesn't matter that your buddy's shooting this gun and you're shooting that gun and he tried to modify number three steel and you're gonna try that. You may have to try different brands of shot shells. They're all using different powders. Most of the steel shot is all made by the same company. So <coughs> shot shell company A and shot shell company B are, are, are getting pellets from the same place. Most of the time, there's a couple brands out there that uh, use different stuff um, to uh, to have a cheaper shot shell available to you. But uh, generally, most of the stuff on the shelf is is probably made in the same place as far as pellets go. Um, there's different wads, there's different uh, different powders that will burn at different rates, and your different chokes. So try all those different things, but you have to try what you're using in your gun and uh, and and look at the math. So. Uh, we're going to catch up in the chat room. I see there's a few questions popping up. We're going to answer a few more poll questions, and then we'll uh, we'll keep on going. Steve, I'll go ahead and uh, answer Andy's question uh, about uh, cautions for shooting steel uh, through the full choke uh, with steel versus lead. Um, all today, uh, all of today's modern firearms are okay to shoot steel through. Uh, the old guns where they ran into a little bit of problems were with the Damascus barrels. Uh, so you definitely don't want to shoot steel of any type through a Damascus barrel uh, if you're worried about it possibly being damaged. Uh, but all today's modern barrels, it's not a problem. Uh, but you do want to look on each individual choke uh, the manufacturers put out and it'll tell you which ones you can shoot steel through and which ones you can or you shouldn't shoot lead through. So we always tell you, uh, look at the chokes and if it says no steel, don't shoot steel through it. Um, chances are, if anything's going to happen, it might put a bulge in your barrel where that constriction comes when the steel shot goes through. So it might do, it's not going to explode that barrel, but it might put a, a little bulge ring there uh, because that steel does not deform and it's being constricted instantly uh, when it goes uh, through that choke. So uh, do whatever the choke says. If it says do not shoot steel sh shot through it, then don't. And one of the other questions was um, uh, choke for steel in terms of a shot string and pattern. Um, everything is different because like Steve said, there's no standardization within the chokes uh, from manufacturer to manufacturer. So if you wanna get really precise, you would have to mic every choke that you have, write it down and then um, look at things that way according to what, what the micrometer says. Um, the other one Adam had was on the on the lost bird or the wounded uh, studies. Um, was that taken in a field or a marsh or without a dog? Uh, I can tell you that the pheasant study was done obviously in upland habitat without a dog. Uh, I asked that specific question, and according to Roster, when they did their surveys, um, so a lot of people do not hunt with dogs. Um, I do know that for the waterfowl, it was done. Um, uh, out of blinds, uh, you know, where they had uh, controlled hunt areas and stuff like that. I don't know if they had dogs. I'm assuming that some probably did and some didn't because 
the hunters were just that they were hunters. Some of them knew they were being watched. Others didn't. So uh, I don't ever remember uh, Tom talking about that, except on that pheasant study. Do you remember that, Steve? I don't remember him talking about dogs on waterfowl, but what I do recall is that they wanted birds um, um, on the water and dead within 30 seconds. That was part of the study. And uh, that seems like a really long time, but it's in reality, it's not. Um, one of the biggest things they noticed were birds that would drop out of the flock that people didn't even go after because they didn't see them. And so after the flocks would fly away, the, the observers would continue to watch them with binoculars. And that's why that wounding loss is important. The hunters don't even know. Uh, by law, you have to go look and the vast majority of hunters do go look. But if that bird goes around the corner after 200, 300 yards and you can't see it anymore and then falls out of the sky, you didn't even know. So that was the biggest thing that I remember him talking about on the waterfall side of things. But I, I don't recall anything about dogs with waterfall. So now we're going to get into the... Uh, <clears throat> the lead shot versus steel shot. And, uh, you know, I, I half jokingly say it's a historical debate between the misinformed. Um, we all have to make up excuses why we missed. The wind was blowing, the boat was rocking, the sun was in my eyes, whatever it might be. The dog barked, you know, I, I tripped over my duck calls. Um, and I'm laughing because I've done it too. But uh, I spent a fair amount of time in a duck blind in particular, and <clears throat> we always have excuses of why we missed. But um, generally, if it's the shot size, it's because we made a poor decision. We can fix that. So we're going to get on to and how we can. So we got the miss, miss, miss. You've heard them. Steel shot pattern's bad. Steel shot doesn't kill. It doesn't have the knockdown power. Steel shot goes through birds while lead shot mushrooms and does more damage. Guarantee I've heard that one. I've heard some of you guys here in Woodbury tell me that one. Um, and steel shot damages barrels. So I don't remember who asked that question, but uh, we will we will address that uh, in a minute. Marty, Marty kind of already covered some of that. Well, how did they start? So we, we like to call them the spin masters and they were all promoted over time. You know, uh, Billy told Bobby and uh, Bobby told uh, his buddies as well and, and, and on down the road and it makes sense. It helps us rationalize why we missed that duck that was backpedaling the, right over top of the decoys and makes us feel better. So um, the writers for outdoor magazines, uh, they're, they're partly to blame. The employees of shot shell companies, uh, if, if they, wanna, they wanna sell you whatever they're gonna make the most money on, right? Uh, you get friends of uh, the influential people, whether it's fish and game agencies, conservation organizations, politicians, people that are in the know, or um, at least uh, in the position to, to change things. Um, all, of, all of those things uh, over time um, start, to, start to affect what we believe. There's some creative marketing strategies out there by manufacturers. Um, you know, it's, we talk about you know, speed being the, the newest thing. Well, how do they get those shot shells to go go faster? They they take some pellets out. Well, they take the pellets out that gives you less 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 abilities. And you know, we uh, when we first started teaching this class, we used to give specific examples of each of these, but we thought we probably shouldn't be naming people and companies and and brands and uh, and you know, you know throwing people into the bus. That doesn't seem like the right thing to do. So if you want to do the research, you can find them. But uh, you know, we're just telling you there's some of that stuff out there, and and uh, you want to trust but verify uh, everything you read. So these are all interesting things. And the other one is retailers pushing products that uh, have better sales margins. If your job is to sell things and make money and you work on a commission, they're probably gonna work, uh, work a little bit, a little bit of that into their, uh, their sales pitch too. So always, uh, always question what's going on. And we're gonna help you after this class understand some of the things that you need to know to, uh, to make better, more informed decisions. Like I said, most of the pellets are all the same. We had the, the copper plated shot, the buffered shot, you know, this, uh, this will come around and, uh, and help you make some good decisions. So the three major contributors were the outdoor press. They're not scientific. They're not fact-based. They're out there to sell magazines. They need to sell magazines so they can make a profit. They make a profit by advertising and they're not going to write anything bad about somebody that pays to advertise. So if you want to go out and, uh, and say you're great and spend a whole bunch of money saying you're great and you get the magazines to say you're great. What do we as hunters all believe that we're great? But maybe there's a small guy out there doing some really, really good stuff. He doesn't have the advertising budget. He's just making a good product. And uh, uh, maybe it's better. And uh, we just don't hear about it because they don't pay quite as much. And what will happen is occasionally that magazine will criticize that small guy who doesn't want to advertise. And so your magazine company, you have some guy out there competing with your, uh, your paying advertiser. 
you're going to try to uh, <clears throat> try to make them go away. So we've actually seen some of that happening where uh, where they're trying to, to to get rid of the competition through uh, through advertising and uh, through outdoor press. To me, it seems like this is the most uh, most responsible group. They're uh, they're they're publishing the magazines and they're they're regurgitating information from other magazines and like I said, a lot of it's not scientific. It's just uh, some guy that's gone out and and sold his writings for the uh, uh, for the for the business side of things. Your family. Now this is this is where we always get in trouble with this class. And I see some people sit in the back of the room and kind of cross their eyes and you know cross their arms and their 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 eyes kind of squint at me and their faces and neck starts to turn red. Because if I'm telling you that your dad told you something wrong, you're going to want to get up and, and fatten my lip. But maybe your dad was told wrong. You got to believe him. He told you he told you the right thing. He told you what he believed. He wanted you to shoot more ducks. But maybe somebody told him wrong. So maybe it's your tradition. Maybe you want to shoot this gun because that's that's what somebody else in the family shot. Maybe it was a handed down gun. That's no problem. But don't think it's the best just because somebody said it was. You need to uh, to verify some of those things. And how you do that? You pattern your gun and try some different loads. It's it's not not typical for a young hunter to uh, to question his uncles or his grandpa or mom or whoever it is that's uh, taking him out or or maybe uh, maybe one of the DNR officers takes him out on a mentored hunt. They're probably going to believe what we're telling them because they don't have anything different. And so. Uh, when, when you have somebody that you look up to, you know, the, the guy up the street that's got the cool duck boat and a bunch of neat decoys and his, his dog will hold the cheese on the end of his nose. You think he's, uh, he, he's a great gift of waterfowling. And uh, you're not going to question what that guy says. When you're a little guy, you're just going to do what, uh, what they say. So that's, uh, that's a pretty big one too. And the next one is your peers. Everybody likes a little friendly competition. Nobody wants to get teased by their buddies. So you're going to fit in by using the right gear. Maybe you got to buy a certain coat brand, or maybe you got to buy a certain shotgun type, or maybe you got to buy a certain decoy or whatever it may be. That's, that's going to make it the right thing. Well, in reality, a lot of times, if you're just in the right place, you're going to shoot ducks. Desire to win that friendly competition might push you to try the latest and greatest. Maybe you got to buy this extra $200 choke tube because your buddy said it's better, but you don't really know why he said it's better. You just read what they said. You didn't find any scientific data backing it up. So trust the science. Roster provided an unbiased study with data-driven results. Okay. Again, we're talking 200,000 rounds. That, that's a lot of shooting. That's a lot of cases of ammo. That's, that's a lot of pellets flying through the air, knocking down 16,000 birds. Just keep that in the back of your mind. That, that's more than any of us are going to shoot at in our lifetime. Unless you're some kind of a, a guide and, and, and probably guiding spring snow, you're, you're never going to have the opportunity to shoot that much or at that many birds. He did the work for you. Trust it, try it, put it to use. We got a lot of this season left. Uh, we, we wanted to get this done a little bit earlier this year. <clears throat> um, met a few difficulties, but we're getting out here. There's a lot of this season left. Go out, it's gonna be nice this week around the state of Iowa. Uh, pattern your guns and see what we're talking about and then, and then put it to use in the field. I, I, I will promise you that it will change the way you hunt. So we're gonna talk about those myths. We're gonna just spill them a little bit. Okay, steel shot pattern's bad. That's wrong. We've already showed you that steel shot, and, and you'll see it if you want pattern, steel shot pattern's better than lead. All things equal. You put the same number of pellets in a number four load of lead versus number two load of steel. You put the same number of pellets in a smaller area. That's a better pattern. Steel shot doesn't kill. Well, we talked about the feather balling and all the reasons that the lead pellets slow down and spread out. Uh, steel is going to kill. It's going to pass through farther. It's going to maintain its velocity going through the feathers, and it's going to penetrate the vitals in the, in the central nervous system. Steel shot doesn't have knockdown power. No pellets have knockdown power. When you start getting to the slugs and stuff like that in a shotgun, yes, but the pellets are too small. They're not deforming. They're not making a devastating wound channel like what you see with hydrostatic shock from a, from a center fire rifle. Steel shot goes through birds. Yes, it does. That's exactly what we want. But then it says, while well, lead shot mushrooms out and does more damage. That is wrong. The mud shot, the lead shot didn't mushroom out. The lead shot got, but we've seen that. We've all seen that, so we believe it. Well, the truth of the matter is the lead shot was damaged either in the loading process, when we touched off the gunpowder, when it traveled up the barrel, all those, all those things that we talked about in the internal ballistics, that's when all the lead deformed, not when it hit the bird, okay? Now, steel shot damages the barrels. Well, sometimes we've got to be a little bit careful there. Like Marty already talked about, the, old, the older guns with the softer steel, 
that's well, that's a whole other thing. You need to check what you're shooting. If you have an old gun, you need to go talk to a to a reputable gunsmith that can that can tell you that gun's safe. If you shoot through the wrong choke, you could get that ring bulge, like Marty talked about. We've we've seen that with guns on multiple occasions. And the other thing is the Damascus barrels with the twist. So that can happen. But steel shot with the modern with the modern wads. When steel shot was first on the market, they used lead shot components and it didn't work. It did cause some problems. Modern steel shot has a really thick wad that overlaps, the pedals overlap. So the pellets never touch the barrel. They're going out and, they're, and that wad is holding together. And the lead, the steel shot wads actually help improve shot performance as well, or pattern, patterning performance as well. Uh, there's some really good wads out there and some technology that uh, has, has really, um, really helped us out with throwing real dense patterns down, down range. So we're gonna talk a little bit about recoil <clears throat> and, and one wouldn't think that this would be that important in, uh, in shooting performance, but um, it is. Uh, it, it's probably one of the most important. And what is recoil? Pretty obvious, it's kickback of a gun when, it, when you fire, okay? And there's two types, you got your felt recoil and your actual, okay? Slightly different, but they both count. According to Roster, who fired a lot of rounds, he does a lot of shooting instruction. We have a lot of other instructors out there. Recoil is the most erosive force in individual shooting performance. It uh, doesn't matter if you're big and tough. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your size. Whatever you're shooting, recoil affects you. You can't control it. You're going to get involuntary flinches. Okay. They, they say the average 200-pound person can, can absorb about 100 rounds a day from, from trap loads. Beyond that, you start to develop an involuntary flinch, okay? And, and so if you're gonna flinch or you're gonna pick your cheek up off the stock or you're gonna close your eyes before you pull the trigger or you're gonna point the gun down, you know, push the gun down to try and make up for that recoil, those are all things that are gonna cause you to, to miss birds. So you need to have a gun that you can shoulder, mount the gun, shoulder it properly, follow through on your bird and, and pull the trigger while keeping your head down on the barrel. If you don't, you're gonna miss. Shooting performance goes down as recoil number of rounds goes up. Again, we, we just talked about it. The, the, the gun beats you up and you keep shooting it, you're, 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 gonna, you're gonna have a poor shooting performance. And you're know, not to pick on anybody, but uh, I, I can tell you that I've gone out in the, in the fall checking teal hunters specifically, and there's guys stand there in piles of three and a half inch BBs. Uh, they look punch drunk, they're, they're, their eyes are glossy, they have headaches, they're having a miserable day and they have two dead teal. Um, and, and they can't figure out why they're not hitting them. Well, they're shooting these abusive loads that are designed for, for, for bigger animals, and there's just not enough pellets out there to hit them small birds. The recoil's beating them up, and they got to shoot a lot because there's a lot of opportunity, and they can't hit anything. If they would uh, maybe go to an ounce of sixes or sevens, they'd have a lot more luck and a lot less recoil. So you get your shooter fatigue. I just talked about that a little bit, and um, you've probably seen it in your buddies if, if you're one of those guys I just talked about. Um, but I've seen it multiple times, and uh, I can tell you a lot of times in the opening days, after a couple days, um, the hunters aren't out, and uh, you, know, you, you start talking to guys like, oh, the birds are still around, but I just didn't really want to go. Well, they're, they're tired and they're beat up from shooting too big of loads. And there is something to be said about size. You want to match a shot and gun to the individual shooter, um, <clears throat> whether, whether it's a young hunter, uh, a smaller stash of female hunter, or maybe you're 6'3 and 240 pounds, but you got in a car accident and have a bad neck, right? There's different things that happen that, uh, that will affect your recoil. I can tell you personally, I used to shoot a 10 gauge a lot. I loved it, had great success with it. And uh, I'm really seeing the benefits of the lighter 12 gauge loads and, and 20 gauges now. And uh, I have Marty to thank for that, for, for dragging me into this class. And uh, uh, there's a reason I'm here tonight. I've, I've bought in and I, and I, um, I, it, it's, it's really changed the way, my, the way I hunt and it's made me a much more effective hunter and uh, I actually enjoy shooting the gun now. It's not beating me up. Bottom line is less recoil, you can get better performance out of yourself, okay? The shot shells can do it. If you pattern them, get the right stuff, you're, you're gonna be in great shape. You don't need these great big abusive loads to, uh, to have success. So felt recoil, that can be influenced a little bit by barrel porting, your action type, recoil pads. Maybe you got a nice cushiony uh, recoil pad on your uh, gas operated semi-auto gun versus a, uh, uh, 
a single shot with a straight stock and a, and a plastic recoil pad, right? That's just going to feel better on your shoulder. Uh, the barrel portings and those other things, it, 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 it gets rid of some of the recoil, what you feel, but it's still there. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Actual recoil is influenced by calculable factors. And we have an equation for that. Again, this is math and science, right? It's not secrets. It's not magic. There's no smoke and mirrors. We can, we can repeat all of our results. That's, that's what scientific data does. And so we're not going to make you work through this equation or remember it, but we did it for you. And we have two examples. So um, everybody always asks me in this class, I'll tell you, I like to shoot an ounce of uh, ounce number sixes at, at doves and teal. That's why I shoot an ounce number six steel shot out of an approved cylinder choke. That's usually what I'm shooting. But that's my gun. That's me. That's what works. I patterned it. And an eight pound gun with one ounce of shot, shooting in a load going 1,365 feet per second. That's, that's what I was shooting. And you consider the wad and powder at 30 grains, you get 24 pounds of recoil. Okay. Well, what does that equate to? Talking about those guys shooting those ounce and three eighths loads, same gun, but now it's going 1550. It more than doubles. And to give you a comparison, would anybody want to go out and shoot a 30 at 650 times or a 300 wind mag 50 times? That's what you're looking at that with, with that approaching that 50 foot pounds of energy. That's abusive. And I, I've, I've seen it. I've seen guys shooting two and three boxes of that in a day at birds and you can't figure out why they can't hit them and why they feel so miserable. So a couple of interesting things there. Go out and weigh your gun. That'll give you kind of an idea. Um, I believe that we'll be sharing this, uh, this program. So you can always go back and find that equation. But if it feels good, shoot it. And uh, if it works good, you, you'll be fine. But um, just remember, you don't have to shoot those abusive loads. So I've been throwing a lot of stuff at you. You're kind of in the home stretch. We got a little bit of a summary. Take a couple minutes, answer a few questions, and then we'll, uh, we'll get back to it. And we'll have as much time as you need at the end to answer all your questions. Yeah, Steve, I'll go ahead and answer a couple of them. Uh, one that came in was uh, the steel shot feather ball. And the answer to that is yes, it will feather ball, but it's not near to the magnitude as lead because uh, steel shot doesn't deform and it doesn't have those flat edges uh, to gather more uh, feathers uh, and get bigger as it as it penetrates into that bird. But yes, you will have feather balling with steel shot also. Um, the other question that came in uh, was, uh, if steel was the best for pheasants, why does PF put their name on Prairie Storm lead shot? Um, that's something you would have to take up with the management uh, uh, within Pheasants Forever. Uh, don't know, you know, that's that's not our decision. Uh, I do know that we have done this program at the state, uh, or not the state, but at the National Pheasants Forever um, uh, conventions. Uh, I did it in Madison, Wisconsin, and I believe I did it in Des Moines when it was there. So uh, we, we have had the opportunity to share this information on a couple of occasions. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, something you'd have to ask the PF folks. All right, we'll get back into it. So um, that was, those are some good questions, guys. I appreciate them. And just remember, every time you read something or see something, think about uh, why that happened and why they did that. So very good question. Why they put their name on it? Well, if you think about some of the things we've said, you'll, you'll probably come up with some reasonable explanations. So um, we also did this. Uh, Marty said we've done this on a nationwide basis. We've done it some national stuff. We also did it for uh, uh, biologists in the Midwest, um, upland bird biologists, you know, the, uh, the decision makers in many states. And it was very well received. Some very intelligent people that uh, uh, had some very, very good questions for us at the uh, at the end of the day, and um, it opens up your eyes. And like I said, we don't care what you use as, as long as it's legal. But there's a lot of places where non-toxics required. So we just want you to understand that you can go up there and be successful. Um, as a conservation officer, I, I take a lot of phone calls. Um, you know, this time of year, sometimes 30, 40, 50 a day, it, it just depends. And uh, one, of the one of the things I've been telling people here the last couple of years, and maybe some of you are listening here today, um, if, if you have the opportunity to hunt, maybe you're just getting into it and you're trying to figure out which areas are non-toxic, which areas I can shoot lead and which, which shells I should have, maybe don't worry about it. Just start with steel, learn how to shoot it and, and pick up a duck stamp and a migratory bird stamp and your federal duck stamp a lot of these areas that you're walking around hunting pheasants are going to have some small potholes on it maybe you sit down and 
uh, jump up a couple dollars and get, get a shot at them as they come back into, into the pond or maybe you get to jump shoot them. So it's just one more opportunity. And I know if I was walking around shooting at pheasants and shooting number five lead, I used to shoot a lot of that, but nothing more frustrating than uh, walking up on a, on a, a bunch of green heads and uh, not being able to shoot at them because you're carrying lead shot that day. So um, just another, another point of view, uh, provide you some more opportunity and maybe a couple extra stamps will uh, allow you to uh, uh, put some more money in the coffers to purchase more land and uh, give you some more shooting opportunity, uh, picking up the duck stamp and stuff. So there's always reasons, but again, we, we don't care what you shoot. We're just trying to show you that you can, uh, uh, you can be successful shooting this stuff. So we're going to summarize some of the things we talked about. We've been talking a long time through a lot of stuff at you. It's a little bit of a challenging uh, uh, venue to do this virtually. It's a lot of things for you to talk about. That's why we took the break. So hopefully you're picking up some of it and we'll uh, be able to keep going. But uh, wounding loss was, was very important. That's something that definitely has to be addressed if we're going to move forward and, and, and care for the resource. And uh, <clears throat> it takes pretty little effort on our part to maybe save quite a few of those birds by, by shooting better, uh, better patterns at them and, and, and more effective equipment. Um, utilizing more effective equipment, maybe we can reduce that by a good percentage and, and have a lot more birds to shoot at. So we have to influence your behavior. And we have to improve your shooting skills. You can't take shots beyond what you can shoot. How do you fix that? You go out and you practice, okay? You have to learn to estimate distance. If, if the birds are too far away, you're not going to kill them. You're just likely going to cripple them. So you have to practice at those known distances. If you only practice at 20 yards all year, why are you taking 60 yard shots when you're in the field? Doesn't make any sense, right? How do you know how far away they are? Maybe you got to use some markers. Maybe it's the height of the trees. Go out there with a range finder and measure distances of certain objects or, or step it off. Uh, with some of our modern technology, whether you, you get on, your, on, on whatever application you have on your phone and you can measure from point A to point B. Um, or maybe set your decoys at known distances. You see that I have in range in, in parentheses why are you putting decoys at 60 yards, 70 yards away? If the birds land outside of them, you're not gonna be able to shoot them. It's just too far for shotguns. So, so a little bit of uh, change in the way you do things can, can really help that. So distance is, 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 is key as well as uh, uh, not shooting beyond what you can shoot. In roster study, we talked about this a little bit. We asked you, you know, how far was the, how far was the first shot? And, uh, <clears throat> this, this I think is kind of staggering. Like we said, most people can only shoot to like 23 yards, but the average first shot in them 200,000 rounds at 16,000 birds was 68 yards past shooting and 50 yards over decoys. The first shot. Now, some of you, a lot of you folks are waterfall hunters out there and you got the wind at your back at 20 mile an hour and you jump up and shoot a goose at 50 yards on your first shot. Where are they on your second and third shot? They're, 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 they're gaining 10 yards, 15 yards quickly uh, and getting away, okay? So when talk, talking about ducks over decoys and pass shooting, it's a little bit better, 48 and 37 yards. But again, that first shot on average is way past where most people can shoot, okay? Be patient. As an officer, I can see that I, I get to watch this a lot. People get excited because they've been waiting all week to go hunting and the ducks come in and they don't want somebody else in the lake to shoot them. So they start burning powder. And the ducks, the ducks were just trying to set up to get in there. They wanted to come in, but they got shot at. And so if I told you this without telling you that this was observed over 200,000 rounds fired, you'd never believe it. So that's why we use this, this scientific data to, to show you. But that's too far. Those are, those are too far shots. Now, with birds up against the blue sky, it's, it's not as bad as pheasant hunter, with pheasant hunters. Um, they can, uh, they're, they're working their dog. The dog's in range. The bird's jumping up by the dog. But waterfowlers, are shooting at big birds up against the sky. There's, there's nothing to work. So using, using some of those um, tools, you know, like the, the trees or where your decoys are, maybe some measurements on ground, that, that'll help you out a lot. And, you know, if you put your decoys 30 yards out and the birds are 40 yards in the air, that's a 50 yard shot. If you want, you can do the math, but I can tell you that that's right. Uh, if there's some construction guys out there, you're nodding your heads right now and probably smiling, but that's something to think about. You're shooting at an angle, right? So try to get the birds in close, make sure you can identify them and, and uh, put some good shots on them. So we talked about uh, shot hitting a bird and the bird kept going. If you're a waterfall hunter, 
you've probably heard this and you've come up with all the reasons the shot bounced off because steel shots horrible that just went through the feathers all those things in reality <clears throat> that bird was farther than 60 yards how do we know that we use science the human ear cannot recover that quickly once the shotgun blast occurs the pellets hit the target that happens so fast that you can't hear that inside 50 yards uh, your ear doesn't have time to recover to hear the sound um, so when you're hearing that happen that bird's far away i've seen it i've done it myself um, you see that bird coming by, oh, that's, that's my last shot. You pull the trigger and you hear the pellets hit it. Who's far? Not saying you can't kill it. Every once in a while you do, but more often than not, you're going to cripple that bird if you're not practicing at that range. So be careful. And if you want to read more about that, there's a book called High Pheasants by Sir Ralph Payne Galloway. You can find that. And they, uh, they did a lot of this, uh, launching birds at, uh, at known distances out of towers and, uh, and uh, doing some math on uh, how fast quick the ear can recover. So um, pretty interesting stuff, but uh, keep that in the back of your head. Try to ignore that non-scientific data. Um, the misconceptions that come with equipment and ammo, it could just be good advertising. It could just be that, uh, you know, Hunter A is, is well known and he gets paid a lot to say that this is the best stuff he's ever seen. Don't get wrapped up in clever marketing. Um, you know, the example I use was that speed kills. Well, you know, a lot of times they try to say that, you know, that, that extra couple hundred feet of seconds, that takes eight, eight inches off your lead at 40 yards. The human eye can't discern eight inches at 40 yards. We don't know what that is. So um, generally in this class, we talk about some different shooting techniques, whether it's a swing through or the point and shoot or some of the new stuff that we're learning with the, uh, what we call OSP. Um, and we'll have some of those classes going on generally. We, we incorporate that into this class and you get to see it. And um, if there's a couple of different methods of shooting where you don't have to worry about that, it's more of an apparent lead. And what may be a foot to me, it may be not be a foot to you. you. You know, the guy says, oh, I let it by a car length. That, that doesn't really matter um, because that's what he saw the lead as. You, your brain, if you can continually practice and, and break targets at different ranges, your brain does that calculation for you. It tells you when to pull the trigger. But um, the speed kills thing, it's actually making a, a product that is uh, inferior, costs them less money to make because there's less shot in it, and they sell it for more money and tell you it's better. So um, don't get wrapped up in that. There's a lot of misinformation and opinions out there, okay? Whether whether you were told wrong by the, the guy at the sporting goods store who just wants to sell a product that makes more money, um, whether a company did more advertising, maybe your buddy made the greatest shot of his life on a on a, on, a, on a mallard that was banded, and now you think that's the best stuff. Go out, shoot your guns, try the different loads and, and, and actually see for yourself what works for you. Then you gotta improve your shooting skills. 23 yards is, is what rosters, uh, all, all the training that he's done is, uh, is where the average person can shoot. And what we generally do when we do this class in person is we go out and we stand on the 20 yard line and, and we let you shoot 10 targets. We pick the easiest shot for you. Um, you know, it's just a crossing shot into, into your, into your swing. So it's real easy. If you get eight out of 10, you get to move back to the 30 yard line. If you get eight out of 10, you get to back to move the 40 yard line, get eight out of 10, you get to go to the 50. And of all the classes we do, and Marty, correct me if I'm wrong, I've never seen anybody make it past the 40 yard line and the vast majority don't make it off the 20 or 30. Correct. So we got to improve this by practice. And so if, if, if we can, on average, maybe, maybe you're all above average. I hope you are. That'd be great. Um, but if you're an average shooter and you can only shoot to 15, 20, 25 yards, why would you practice on a bird that you might cripple and not have any more opportunities? So go out and, and practice shooting at the targets and, uh, and get more proficient so that when you shoot three times at that bird, um, you're not wasting your three shot cells. You can shoot one at him and hit him. The other thing is practice with steel shot. Train your brain. Okay, steel does pattern differently. It does fly differently. It's going to be different than lead shot. Everything about it. And so, if you if you truly go out to the store or, or get online and start doing some shopping, and you find a a an average steel load, you're going to find that it's really not that much more expensive than lead. And in a lot of places, it's cheaper. Uh, there's so much steel shot fired now. Um, if, if you buy the cheapest of the cheap lead loads, um, they're going to be the, the, the worst performers as far as pattern. So uh, we have the question about the copper plated shot and, and buffered loads. Well, they're doing all these things to try and make lead pattern better. 
why not just start with something that patterns better out of the box? And so your, your lower end steel may throw a better pattern <clears throat> and you got the same number of pellets going out the same velocity, carrying the same amount of energy. Why do you have to carry the one that has a, a, a prettier box? You know, try them and, and, and work it out. But uh, steel does definitely fly through the air different than steel than, than lead. So practice with steel. And there's some pretty inexpensive steel loads out there. There's some um, there's some vendors, uh, local vendors and online vendors that uh, that can find you some stuff that is uh, not expensive to shoot. And then help with consistency. So I mentioned that I've been explaining to hunters, hey, you know, grab some steel shot, grab a duck stamp, and and shoot both while you're out there. Um, if you're constantly switching back and forth, you're inevitably going to have the wrong shot shells or the wrong choke at the wrong time. So if you continue to shoot, you know, one load all the time at everything you're going to be much more consistent and much more confident in your shooting, Billy. And um, not to pick on Marty, but um, I know he, uh, he has one favorite gun and load and choke combination. They shoots just about everything. And uh, if you ever have the opportunity to hunt with Marty, you'll, you'll see that it works. Nothing's going to help you bring the birds home if you can't hit them. Okay. You got to practice. This is something that you can change. Okay. Nothing can make it, nothing can make you kill more birds if you can't hit them. Okay? That That's, it can't be any more obvious than that. If you miss them, you're not going to get them. So <clears throat> threw a lot of stuff at you. We don't, we don't, we're not trying to, uh, to, to sound arrogant or that you have to do what we're saying. We're just, we're trying to throw some information at you that um, was proven to us to, to work. Uh, we, we want to help you be better hunters. We want to protect the resource. And it just seems to me that if, if we can make you better shooters, make you harvest more birds, save you some money and have more birds for other people to harvest. That just seems like a win for everyone. And so try some of what we're saying. If you have questions, we're always available, but we would like to do more in-person classes and that we can interact and ask more questions and have discussions. Uh, I understand this is pretty much a one-sided conversation here tonight, but um, we, we want to get this information out there and let you start thinking about it. And if it did start a fire, um, there's some other stuff out there. So we have some DNR resources, obviously the in-person clinic. Um, you get the hands-on experience. You can learn some different shooting techniques and uh, try multiple shot shells. It's all, all, all really good stuff to do, right? Different brands, different sizes, all those different things. And you get some trigger time. That cannot be stressed enough. You have to pull the trigger a lot and consistently in your round to be a good shooter. So the other thing you do is look for some of the DNR virtual and, and webinar offers. This has been something that we've been trying to do this year a lot with Megan talking earlier in the day, earlier in the program. We, um, <clears throat> we, we've done six or eight of these that I know of, uh, probably more. That's, that's all I've been involved in. And um, they've, they've been received really well. And like I said, we're not, we're not trying to show you everything. We're just trying to get the information out. There's a lot of stuff I didn't tell you because we just had a couple hours to talk about it. But check out what we have to offer. And if you, uh, if you want to help yourself a little bit, uh, here's a link to some, uh, some Gil Ash stuff. This is something that we promote with the DNR. We've, we've worked with Gil and Vicki, and uh, they have some really, really good stuff. And uh, I tell you what, it'll, it'll change the way you shoot. They have some great stuff on YouTube, the three-bullet drill, the, the flashlight drill, talking about gun mounting, and, and uh, which is it's just critical if the gun's not mounted in the right place or not mounted consistently, you're not going to shoot good. They have their OSP school. It's a shooting school that... Uh, <clears throat> talks about a little bit different shooting technique and how to follow birds, that sort of thing. It's great stuff. And uh, <clears throat> you're going to think this is kind of silly that I have the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service bird ID stuff, but this is a couple of U YouTube links that will really help you out because if you can't tell what the bird is out there, it probably is too far away. But if you can identify it and you're concentrating on the way in, pick that one bird out of the flock, identify it, find the unique characteristic on it, and then uh, concentrate in that bill and uh, pull the trigger. So it's going to make you a lot more successful hunter. What we want you to remember is to be safe out there. If you do have any questions, there's my name and email address, my phone number. We'll stick around here as long as you would like tonight and answer questions. Um, you're probably tired of hearing me talk. I hope you uh, hope you learned a few things. And if we can uh, help you out, we definitely will. So I guess I'm done talking tonight. If Marty's got anything to add, then we will uh, we'll answer those questions and uh, we'll move on from here. Yeah, just, just a couple of things, Steve. Um, <coughs> we, we talk about consistency and improve your skills. And one thing that I would tell everybody, pick one gun and stick with it. Um, because gun fit is so critical, especially when it comes to gun mount. 
and that's incredibly important. And then uh, the other thing is, is focus on your target and more importantly, focus on the front edge of your target. Uh, I've been learning so much more about the brain science behind shooting that it, it, it scares me. And your, your eyes are always going to go want to be pulled to the slowest part of the target, which is always the back end. And 99% of the times when you miss, you're behind your bird. And so the best advice I can give you when you're a wing shooter uh, is what an old boy gave me uh, one day. He says, young man, he says, shoot them where they eat, not where they sit. He says, you do that and focus on that. And he says, you'll vastly improve your bag. And uh, so, so focus on the, on the leading edge of your target and uh, shoot them where they eat, not where they sit. Perfect. We did have a couple questions come in. Um, one over in the chat um, from Justin wanting to know, he's always heard that if you can see the white on a goose, goose's face, it is in range. Is that true? I've heard that as well. Yes. Uh, uh, and so if you're concentrating, you're at least concentrating on the right end of the bird. That's important. But uh, eyesight, lighting, there's a lot of different uh, variables there. So it's a good rule of thumb. But uh, being in range is, uh, again, comes back to your shooting, shooting abilities. So um, it's a good rule of thumb. But I think the key to that is, is, is identifying the bird uh, or a part of the bird and, and concentrating on the right end. Uh, when I was a young hunter, a friend of mine's dad, um, he's adamant that we, we only shot Drake Mallards and never really figured it out. And uh, uh, one of the reasons for that is he wanted us identifying a bird in the, uh, in the spr out, out, of a, out of a flock, rather than looking at the whole flock and pulling the trigger, he would say, identify that or find the, the one different bird in that flock and concentrate on it. And I think that's where a lot of those things come from. Uh, a lot of the wives tales that we've heard have some, some substance to them and there's a reason that they're saying. And so uh, I, I don't think we ignore what we've been told in the past, I think we just uh, try to try to wonder why it was said and, and and think through it logically why that could help us be better shooters. So that's what I think that is. It's it's more concentrating on the right end of the bird and looking at that white patch. Our eyes are going to naturally go to the moving part. We're, we're predators. Our eyes are in the front of our our, our faces, and uh, with uh, with a, a bird coming by with moving wings, that that's what our eyes are going to see, and uh, you have to really concentrate on the front end of the bird. So. That's it's kind of a long answer to say it depends, but that's really what it, what it, what it is. So that's a great question. And we had um, one additional question that came in through the Q and A. Um, they may have missed it, but they wanted to know if you compared about twenty gauge versus twelve gauge. Sure. So again, again, um, you have. You don't necessarily want to compare gauge. You want to compare the, the, the shot charge because you can get a 20 gauge with a three quarter ounce load and a two and three quarter inch shell or a one ounce load and a three inch shell in steel shot. And you get a 12 gauge with a one ounce load. So if I'm shooting one ounce and number six shot, it's one ounce and number six shot. Um, my dad's had great success uh, shooting, uh, shooting uh, an ounce of sixes at teal out of his 20 gauge. And I like to shoot it out of a 12 gauge because I, I like that gun and I shoot it well. Well, I think I shoot it well. I missed quite a few times too, unfortunately. But uh, an ounce of sixes is an ounce of sixes. So um, there are some patterning differences. The 20 gauge barrel is smaller and every pattern, every gun's just a little bit differently. So um, you jump up to a 10 gauge, you have an ounce, you still have an ounce. It, it, it's, uh, it's not necessarily the gauge, it's the, the shot charge is what you're looking for. So um, the only way to know for sure is to put it on paper and, and, and uh, see, see what, uh, what kind of performance you get. Perfect. Thank you, Steve. Um, that wraps up all the questions that have come in so far. Um, any other parting comments from either of you, Marty or Steve? Well, I would just say that, you know, if it, it, part of being or influencing hunter behavior also is that you take this information, um, go out and do your own research. Uh, that's what I always tell people. Don't, don't ever believe anything I tell you. Go do your own research. This stuff is out there. Uh, you can look for it under concept and roster. Uh, the lethality table uh, is an incredible thing because it's scientifically derived. But once you go out, um, start to try and change your hunting buddy's behaviors, you know, because if we can get that tree to grow um, and then if we can continue to do this and get this information out there, uh, we're really going to 
take a bite into reducing wounding loss. And like Steve mentioned earlier, man, we were forced to go to non-toxics over about 2 million waterfowl dying per year of lead poisoning. And if that information got out that there's four to four and a half million dying from wounding loss, oh, that could be devastating to us as hunters. So we need to do our part um, to get that wounding loss down and, and uh, we have to influence each other's behavior and skills. I agree, Marty. That's, that's the purpose of this. You know, we, we want to help you be better. We want to, uh, we want to help you be better in the field. We want to help you be more successful as, as a, as a sportsman, as far as conserving birds. And, and you guys are going to have a lot more fun with your buddies. It gives you something else to talk about in the blind and you can raise your buddies and, 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 and sound, sound real smart because you listen to something like this and you have science to back it up. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, opinions are one thing. Everybody's got them. Everybody, doesn't necessarily want to hear them, but when it's scientific, it's, you can't argue it because it's, it's proven results. So um, I really appreciate you guys sticking around with us for, for two hours. I, I know it's hard after you've been working all day to, uh, to listen to somebody talk that long. Um, but this information, it, it really has, I, I've really seen a, a, the, the waterfall hunters that I've talked to in the field, and that's, that's quite a few of them. Um, they've, they've really enjoyed listening to this and, uh, and applying it. And I agree with Marty, but you don't have to believe me. I'm just, I'm just throwing the information out there to you. Um, try it and, and find out. Um, I really would like feedback from you guys and how we can make this better. Um, I, I think that this, uh, this program has a, a lot of potential to, 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 to make us better at, uh, in conservation in general and better hunters all the way around. So if there's a way that you guys think that we can get, to get this, make this program more effective and, and easier to follow along, um, definitely send it my way. You won't hurt my feelings. I, I want to learn. I, I love the constructive criticism. So I appreciate your time and uh, go tell your friends. And if you got questions, make sure you holler at us. Thank you again, Steve and Marty for, for instructing tonight and sharing all of your very valuable knowledge and, and experience with us. It's truly appreciated. And, and thank you to all of you attendees out there that that joined us tonight and stuck with us through the two hours. Um, like Steve alluded to, um, your feedback is extremely important to us. If you do have some, you have my contact information there. You're uh, uh, more than um, uh, more than welcome to uh, send them my way. Thank you guys. Have a good night. Be safe out there.